the sound of the shofar. That was the sound that God commanded his people to use to call his people to worship and to war. I have heard that sound many times. It was a sound used to call his people to responsibility. I have answered the call of the shofar many times. And I have answered the call of God. It was a call in my life. The call in many lives. You see, I was, my name is Joshua, son of Nun. I was born in Egypt in a time of great trial. My father, a slave in shackles, died at the hands of the tyrants. Then there was Moses and Aaron. They came to Egypt and told us they had been sent by God to give us freedom. Moses went to Pharaoh and said, Let my people go. I knew from that moment that Moses followed God and that I wanted to follow Moses. When Moses spoke to Pharaoh, I stood in the crowd and listened. When Moses knelt to pray, I would kneel and pray. I would stand out his side his tent and wait for him. I would bring him food and water. I would run errands for him. When Moses would sit by the campfire in the evenings, I would sit and listen to him talk about his God. I would ask him many, many questions. And when Moses spoke to me about a bush that burned but never consumed, I was amazed. I became one of Moses' closest associates. I became like a son to Moses. Moses became like a father to me. Today for you is Father's Day, and that is why I've come to speak to you. Being a father is not easy. I know. I am one. Moses taught me many, many things about fatherhood. All that I learned about being a father, I learned from Moses. One of the first things I learned about being a father was trust. Every father wants his son to be successful. He wants his son to be saved. He wants his son to grow and make him proud. We want to be able to trust our sons. Trust is not easily given. Trust must be earned. You see, Moses went on top of Mount Sinai to commune with God, to speak with him and to receive the tablets of law for us. I pitched my tent here at the bottom of the mountain and waited for Moses to return. Now Moses had Aaron, which he loved very much. He trusted Aaron with the Israelite people. He trusted that Aaron would take care of him while he was communing with God. And so Moses left Aaron with the people of God. I waited in my tent for Moses. Just 40 days later, Moses came down the mountain and stood beside me. We heard a commotion within the camp. I said to Moses, certainly there is war within the camp. But Moses said, that is not the sound of victory. That is not the sound of defeat. That is the sound of singing and dancing. So I went with Moses to the camp. And sure enough, there was singing and there was dancing. And there we saw a golden calf. A graven image. Just days earlier, Moses had told them this was not so, that they should not do this. And then he found out it was at the hands of Aaron himself. Oh, how disappointed he was. And when he asked Aaron, what have you done? What is going on here? He said, the people, it's the people who made me do it. They gave me amulets and things of gold, and I threw them into the fire, and a calf came out. If it hadn't been so sad, I would have laughed at myself. How absurd. Oh, Aaron broke Moses' heart. Moses forgave Aaron of this grave sin, but he never trusted him again. Not like he did before. For you see, trust 
is lost, is not easily earned. Once again, I vowed from that day forward that I would never disappoint Moses, that I would be the kind of son that Moses could trust always. Because if I knew if I broke Moses' heart, it would break my trust in him and his trust in me. Trust is so important as a father. Now the second thing that I learned, you see, we were released from Pharaoh himself and came. And, and then we crossed the Red Sea and what a magnificent sight that was. And we were going to Mount Sinai where Moses would receive the Ten Commandments. When we heard there was a, a band of people coming up behind us. It's the Amalekites. They wished to wage war against us and take some of our possessions. So Moses said to me, take some of your best men and go out to battle. And so I did. As I was going out to battle, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up, up upon a small hill to oversee the battle. Moses would raise his hands to the sky. <coughs> Now, your Bible doesn't tell you what they were doing, but I knew, because as long as Moses' hands were raised to the sky, I knew that he was praying for us. But ever if his hands fell, then he wasn't, it seemed. Because when his hands were raised to the sky, we'd be victorious in battle. I could see that the battle was going our way. But when his hands fell, the battle fell to our enemy. When Aaron and Hur had seen what was happening, they sat Moses down upon a rock, and they lifted his hands up. And because of Moses' prayers, and because of both of their willingness to help Moses, we were to win the battle that day. I learned the power of a praying man, how much of a praying man does for his family, how it makes it succeed, makes it be prosperous. You see, it's like, well, well, you see, it's, it's like this, this shofar. Just as it called God's people to war and to worship, our prayers enter the very kingdom of God and go to the very ears of the Savior. And as He hears them, He sends blessings down upon our families and upon our nation. The power of prayer is strong. But you know, sometimes we just can't make it. Sometimes it seems that all is lost. It seems like we cannot carry on, and that is when we need our brothers and sisters to lift us up and give us strength. Strength to endure the battle. Strength to endure the day. That's why we need our brothers and sisters around us. Another thing that Moses taught me was the importance of being diligent and being purposeful about your faith. Fathers, you need to be purposeful about giving the faith to your children. And I'm not simply talking about going fishing and sitting on the lake and having a conversation. I'm not talking about walking down the road and having a simple conversation with them. I'm talking about being purposeful, being diligent, and putting the Word of God into their lives. Just like Moses did for me. We were so close. Often he would take me to the tabernacle with him. There in the tabernacle we would pray and we would sing praises to our God. We'd also look over the Ten Commandments that was given to us. We would go over them word by word and phrase by phrase trying to determine the very essence of what God expected of his people. We wanted to understand what God required of us. It was so important that we be in the temple together. But Moses didn't stop there. He went one step further. He told me about his time on Mount Sinai with God. For Moses spoke to God as a friend speaks to a friend face to face. Oh, wow. What an experience that must have been for him. What an amazing experience. He tried to convey to me with words the experience that he had with God. For he knew that I probably in my lifetime would never have that for myself. Moses was, God was very real to Moses. Because God was real to Moses, he was real to me. Well, soon, Moses took me before the high priests, before the Israelites. And he said to them, this is Joshua. He is like a son to me. Listen to him, and he will lead you to the promised land. 
I wasn't sure why he was doing that, but a few days later, he went on top of Mount Labu, and he looked across the Holy Land, the land that was promised to us Israelites by God. And he looked upon it with great longing. But Moses would never enter that Holy Land. He would never see that Holy he, Moses would never come down from that mountain because of his sin. In fact, Moses died on that mountain. Never saw him again. I thought, why? Why, God? I don't understand. Why wouldn't you allow Moses to lead his Israelite people, lead me into the very promised land that you gave us? Why? You see, sometimes as fathers, we can instruct our children. We can tell them the paths in which we wish for them to go. We can tell them where we want them to go and our dreams and aspirations that we have for them, but Sometimes we simply have to let them go. Let them do the things that we've taught them. We have to release them to God. Because you know what? I don't think that's the only thing that was taught to us that day. I think there was something even deeper taught to us that day as the Israelites' people. For you see, when Moses went up upon the mountain and received the law of God, it was as if he was the law of God. As, he, as, as if he was the righteousness of God. And it seemed as if like he was so righteous. And if Moses was righteous, certainly we could be righteous. But that wasn't so. For you see, even as Moses brought down the law to us, the people, we ourselves could not keep the law. We ourselves that heard it from the very voice of God could not keep the law. And so we wandered in the desert for 40 years, for 40 long years. You see, Moses was one of the most righteous people that I ever knew. He was the most, he's probably, there never will be, nor will there, never will be, never, never, there has been, been a person like Moses. He was so close to God. He spoke to him as a friend, speaks to a friend. I thought, how righteous is this man? How holy, how close to God is he? And yet, he sinned. He was not perfect. He was not allowed to lead the Israel people to the promised land. That job was left to me, Joshua. Do you know what my name Joshua means in the Hebrew language? It means Savior. It's often an odd turn of events that that same language speaks of Jesus, who was the Savior. You see, when just as Moses took me before the Israelite people and all the leaders and said, this is Joshua, he's like a son to me, listen to him. Just so the, son, the, the, the God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You see, the law in all of its goodness and all what it did for us to teach us what we were expected to do with God still had one flaw. The law had not the ability to make us holy. It had not the ability to make us righteous. And therefore we were still separated from God. For you see, there is only one way in which you can get into the kingdom. And that is through Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross. Only Jesus can span that vast expanse that is between us and to God. We must trust in Jesus so that one day we may be communed with God once again. That is the purpose. One of the last things I said to the Israelites before I left them, I said, choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. You see, that same decision is lying before you today. Who will you choose to serve? Will you choose to serve your own will or the will of the Father? Who will you choose to serve? For there's coming a day when you will no longer be able to serve, to choose. For it says, on that day, the sky will split open, and the archangel of God will come forth and sound the trumpet. Today you have a decision to make. Choose this day whom you will serve. 
as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Won't you come and respond? Won't you, we, won't you stand now as she comes forward and leads us to the song of decision? If you have a decision to make today, come forward and make your decision. 